welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand, and today I'm over at Davis Publication in downtown Worcester, and uh, it's just a block or so from the Worcester Public Library. But I was surprised to find out that Davis Publication has been doing art education publications for over 100 years. And uh, the owner, Erica uh, Davis Wade, and uh, Wyatt Wade, her husband, are wonderful supporters of the arts and had the idea of creating this Davis Gallery here in the Printers Building. And uh, that's where we are. And what we're going to be showing you today is a show called Unearthed by two very remarkable artists um, who are my guests today, Rob and Emily Sandagata. And uh, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to hear you talk about your work. Thanks for coming down and sharing with us. Mm, Thanks for, thank having for having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we're happy to be here. Well, you know, I didn't really know them. Uh, they're sort of new to the area, but I've been noticing Emily's work around because it's kind of, uh, first of all, she's won a few prizes in the area, like at the Fitchburg Art Museum, but also it's work that stayed with me. And uh, I feel like when you have work that sticks in your mind, there's got to be something significant there. So I, I think that's a good sign. So uh, let's see. How did you two get together? Where did you meet and so forth? Well, we originally met in New York City in about 1999 or 2000. I can't remember which one. And we had both moved there after college trying to, you know, figure, find our way into the art scene and, uh, you know, build Boy, a life from there. Boy, that takes a lot of guts, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> moving to New York. Well. And um, after, after, I don't know, a year and a half or so, we decided we wanted to try somewhere else. So we packed up all our stuff and we moved to uh, southern Arizona where we didn't know anyone and decided we'd just explore and, and figure things out. Mm -hmm. And then you were... I know you did a project out there. What was that? Uh, well, in southern Arizona, we, we did a lot of different things, but eventually we decided uh, that teaching art would be a direction that we wanted to go in. So uh, Emily and I both uh, went back to school and got our master's degrees in education and started teaching in a small town called Sierra Vista, Arizona. And we naturally collaborated on lots of different things, like what lessons we were teaching and helping each other out um, on all sorts of things. And uh, we did do a uh, article for School Arts Magazine and a session for the Arizona Art Educators Art Conference on um, using narrative silhouettes in both the elementary and uh, secondary classrooms. And that featured the artwork of um, Kara Walker and uh, Lata Reiniger. I read that on their website and it was really fascinating to read about how that project came about. And so you're still in art education, but in a little different aspect of it here at Davis. Right. Uh, well, right now I'm the digital product manager, so I oversee our ebooks and uh, related digital curriculum products. But I also, uh, because of my experience as an art teacher, uh, consult on various editorial things. And I write an article every month for School Arts Magazine, which is the probably best known product that Dave Davis puts out. Um, and that involves uh, contemporary art, historical art, and uh, trying to unite different artists with a the theme. And then I suggest different projects that would work for that. So even though I'm not in the classroom, I still get to use the teacher part of my brain uh, in that article. Do you consider yourself an art educator first? Is that your main focus? Uh, um, I still consider myself to be an art educator. And I would say I'm equally an art educator and an artist at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I also do music as well when I, oh, when I have yeah. time. Oh, so. yeah. I heard about that. And yeah. Emily, you're, you're teaching as well still, aren't you? Yeah, I currently teach at the Pike School in Andover, Massachusetts, and I have experience teaching for the past 11 years. Um, I see myself as an artist first, and um, I feel the two worlds, teaching and art, art making, are sort of intertwined. So for me, teaching is a creative act that allows me to grow as much as uh, making art. So 
Yeah, I think it's very enriching and expanding and forces you to look at things in all different ways. Yeah. So you teach in Andover, but you're, where are your studios? Uh, well, we just recently moved to Lowell, Massachusetts. And, and you have, both have studios there? We have a live-work studio. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Our, reason, our reason for moving, um, we, all the, body, the work here that you see has all been made um, mainly in Worcester, Mass. And um, we were living in a, a rather tight space. And my studio was on the second floor. And Rob was just making work wherever he could in the home. And that became very hard. So we really wanted to honor the fact that we're both artists. And he also does music. So... Moving you to need its space. Yeah, yeah. so this yeah. was kind of a gift, especially because... And you know, it's a funny thing, but having enough space makes it possible to do works that yeah. are a little grander in scale mm -hmm. and True. to store all the stuff you need to put together. And Yeah. Excellent. So uh, do you criticize each other's works? Do you... Uh, yeah, well, all the time. I mean, we, we kind of constantly give each other feedback about our work and we'll ask each other questions about... What direction we we think uh, things are going in, and uh, it's interesting because we're both working in areas that we didn't necessarily start out in. Um, you know, Emily started out in doing uh, textiles, and I studied sculpture initially. So sometimes I will give her some like structural advice or uh, help her figure out how to keep a piece yeah. together once you've been working on it for a while, and she'll give me a lot of advice in terms of like color or uh, surface quality or things related to painting that I don't really know about mm. since I never, mm. painting was never my uh, main focus. This is a really knockout piece as you walk into the exhibition and this is Emily's work and uh, I don't know if you can see it, maybe we'll be able to show you how physical it is and how dimensional and uh, you know it's a painting but if, it's almost like a sculpture as you uh, as you were saying, what uh, do you want to talk yeah, to us a little bit about? Yeah, I would about? describe this piece as sort of like the beginning of the sculptures being born. The, the rest of the show has many, many um, objects. And for me, this was sort of the, the transformational piece that brought my paintings to um, what is more of a three-dimensional um, quality. So um, this piece was the first piece I made when I moved to Worcester, Massachusetts. So it was also transformative formational in that um, I was living in a new space and experiencing lots of new, new, new. So uh, when I look at this piece, I, I have all these like memories of uh, shifts in, in time and, and place and all of these sorts of... Yeah, I think when you come into a new place, you're sort of overwhelmed with experiences mm -hmm. that want to come out, you know, and mm -hmm. it's so it has that very immediacy and that very expressive quality. Uh, it's a really a knockout piece. Tell me more about the materials in this piece. It's so physical. Yeah, definitely physical. And I think uh, having my studio in the home and sort of responding to, oh, I, I'm not sure I want to go out and spend money on materials. I'm shifting to this new place and I'm shifting to a new job. Um, I just started to get clever about how can I still make work uh, without feeling like tied to, you know, the art store and, you know, expensive fabrics and these sorts of things. So what I started doing is digging through cabinets and drawers within the home, discovering the things that maybe I was ignoring uh, like the spice in the back of the cabinet. Are these spices? So I would use like turmeric um, as I one love of my that. yeah, I love and that. the uh, and so I, I learned over time how to make pigments using random things from the yard, random things from the cabinet. Sure. Well, all the early pigments were earth mm -hmm. substances right. ground up and yeah, and so and then I'm I'm a coffee drinker, and the other thing I would do is when the filter was done, I would instead of abandoning the the grounds, I would keep the grounds and then eventually over time discovered ways to use those in the work that felt honest and sort of added to the meaning of the work. Um, so you can see leaves um, from the yard and sort of tells you time of year and um, you can see uh, coffee grounds and even mur uh, mud and dirt and things like that come into play. Turmeric is a good one too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, <laughs> yep. So, um, oh, it's great. 
it's and again this is your transition into sculpture really yeah it really is yeah mm -hmm. yeah and once I once I worked started working with these materials I I felt that I couldn't leave them and I almost felt like um, using acrylics were too plastic and too wrong and and so I just sort of somehow moved. too artificial yeah yeah too precious yeah right too precious right too pretty so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's a lot to talk about in that regard, so uh, I want to show some of the other pieces as well. I want to hear more about this show, which you've called Unearthed. Uh, how did that title come about, and how did you collaborate, and so forth? Yeah, so I think it was a um, collaborative decision to title the show Unearthed, and uh, for myself, um, it came about because my materials themselves are of the earth in many um, ways but then also I'm using some found objects and those found objects tend to have a history of their own um, things from my past that have been you know not seen for many many years um, the other thing that I would say is uh, my artwork itself also through the making brings up these sort of unearthed or repressed memories and experiences that I've maybe not visited in a while and so um, it seemed very fitting for multiple reasons for me. And how about you Rob? Mm -hmm. What was your uh, thinking with the unearthed idea? Um, well for me it's it's about um, I think a lot about kind of unconscious things and what's happening in the subconscious and what's really going on um, underneath the surfaces and kind of peeling back these characters to reveal truths that are actually happening in um, the real world. So I kind of think of the characters in my drawings really, um, a lot of them don't look like people, but I, I think of them kind of as showing people as they really are without, um, you know, without the surface beauty and the surface quality that you would normally see. So I, um, Thinking about you know uncovering those sort of things that you don't think about or things that are overlooked or things that maybe we don't want to visit um, truths about ourselves and about the world around us. I'm curious to know what your influences are and how you arrived at the kind of work you do. Uh, Rob, are you uh, want to go first on that? Sure. Uh, well, some of my influences are um, well. A major influence early on in my life were, was comic book art um, and kind of illustrations mostly drawn in the 80s, uh, a lot of Alan Moore related comic books like uh, Watchmen and Swamp Thing, which uh, I read probably when I was a little bit too young to be reading them. I had a cousin who was four years older than me and he introduced me to uh, these you know, more adult themed comic books, which I read at the time. and. Uh, a lot of that imagery, especially the Swamp Thing imagery, just really kind of sunk into my brain and I think it kind of matched up with a lot of the things I saw, you know, like Star Wars. I'm also really interested in the work of Hieronymus Bosch. Um, and I also like contemporary um, lowbrow or um, also called, you know, pop surrealist artists who are working in, in that sort of vein. And um, I think there's lots of just lots of different artists who are looking at the the grotesque there's some really incredible outsider visionary artists that i'm also really interested in and uh there's also a lot of contemporary painters that i think emily and i are both interested in um, such as allison Schulnick and summer wheat who are uh painting but really exploring grotesque imagery and, and surfaces with that name summer wheat Mm -hmm. So we can look that up online. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds interesting. The whole history of the grotesque is, is extremely extensive. You know, you go to people like Goya and his, uh, the, the war pick, you know, all those war Absolutely. prints. Uh, what, what was it called? The disasters of war. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a tremendously long history of things that came from imagination and also that kind of expressed a side of uh, life and humanity that wasn't necessarily visible on the surface. Right, and, and I think personally that's a very you know, important role for art in terms of you know, looking at things that are real, that are things that we experience. But it's also, I think that 
there are you know different kinds of art for every purpose and, and every person and um, I think of the grotesque in looking at that kind of art as similar to the way people are interested in you know horror movies or things that are scary or just attractive not in a in a beautiful way but attractive in a in a primal way yes uh, and that's really one of the things that i'm that interested move in. you and touch on something that's very strong in your makeup and right. that you don't even think about and, and i think there's a really very strong line of that that runs you know all the way back to the, to the beginning of art to you know primal cave paintings and you know petroglyphs and that mm -hmm. sort of thing that really extends all the way out through things that people are doing now and Emily's work has that same quality of being sort of scary and dark and grotesque. And I have to tell you that a lot of it is really very, you know, <laughs> so visceral and it's sure. like an ugly thing. But yet my thought is that when something fulfills the function that the artist intended so perfectly, then it has a quality of being right and beautiful. Right, and it's that right thing that I'm sort of going for. So in my process, which is very actually playful and joyous at times where I'm physical and moving around the studio and um, sort of, I would describe it as sometimes having fun, in the end I'm visiting then a memory, a story, a history that may be like harder to deal with. So I feel like it's, it's all of these emotions, it's all mm -hmm. of these things. Mm -hmm. What is the name of this sculpture, Emily? So um, I titled this piece, I'll Carry You. And uh, this piece is actually made up of um, a lot of what people would consider the things that you would throw away, um, both outside their home. Unloved, and unwanted. Absolutely, chunks of wood, um, literally uh, pieces of trash, uh, things literally like- Literally litter. Shells, things like that that have um, washed up. Um, and in the top of this piece, you'll actually find a buoy and I and and I've sort of been thinking about through the process of making a lot of my works um, what are the objects that I'm choosing as I'm making the work and this buoy to me is an extension of all these other things that I've chosen which is has to do with uh, labor and work and sort of uh, my background as a sort of uh, work coming from a working class family and so I feel like it just tells another part of that story of well, your choice of materials also, you know, I th see the content and meaning of the piece relating to the debris in the ocean and mm -hmm. the clutter and people throwing things away randomly and mm -hmm. indulging and consuming and indulging and consuming. And right. your work really speaks to me of, of that issue. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I think that sort of happens within my pieces as I make them is this is sort of this... Um, almost alive but almost dead type of um, push and pull that happens within the pieces and I um, I sort of want to honor that as I as I go. They're very creepy I have to tell you but I'm, <laughs> I'm fascinated by them. You know the idea of I'll carry you to has a certain pathos to it and I think if there was one word I could I think about when I think of your work it's pathos. Mm -hmm. It's uh, there's a, a lot of suffering in it, mm. and but empathy and sympathy, and um, yeah. Emily, I, I think I've discovered that you're also a good writer. Is this <laughs> something you do on the side? I think or? that my work has asked me to do some writing, and I think uh, I feel that there's a story as I look around the works. There's like a relationship, a family. Uh, you know, a sense that these are family members or things like that. So it's caused me to write. Um, a, more than I normally would, and, I, I suppose. Yeah, and your titles are very poetic, too. Like, I love the uh, bundle of woe, <laughs> or, uh, because it, it's, just, uh, I, it's just perfect for, this, for what it is. It Thanks. looks so woeful and so pathetic. <laughs> but I wanted to read this one line, which I read on your statement online, and uh, it talks about uh, the objects being regenerated and they live on as frail organs, barely pulsing and awkwardly beating within each mass. And so it's almost like these little found things are given a second life 
uh, with great empathy and caring and loving attention. And uh, I thought that really, to me, was what you, the work was about. Thanks, yeah. And, and I think also uh, the other thing that my work does is it sort of asks me to visit and be vulnerable of these things that maybe, you know, aren't always accepted, are making you appear weak. And I, and I sort of like opening up the conversation of like, well, it, is it really a weakness to empathize and honor something you know, that no, is... No, it's, yeah, it's, it's almost like a Buddhist thing to see everything as being worthy. You know, both of your works really have a certain rawness and crudeness and almost a brutality about some of these pieces and suffering and, you know, it, it was what people would call difficult. And a lot of people would find it difficult to live with or how do you cope with that idea of, or people calling your work difficult? How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's, I mean, it's understandable if your expectation uh, for art is a more traditional expectation that it's, it's for decoration or it's meant to be beautiful or it's uh, meant to be ideal. Um, and I think, you know, neither of us is interested in, in idealism in any way. It's really more of an interest in things that are real, which is, it's kind of funny for me to say that since I'm drawing things that are very <laughs> unreal, but my, my interest is in things that are real or playing with um, people's expectations. But I think that, um, you know, art today asks us to be open. And to be open, you have to kind of throw away whatever preconceptions you have about what, what is or true. is not art. To be true, to be authentic, mm -hmm. right. I think is what I, how yeah. I would and I would, I would also say that um, I, I would take the idea of our work being difficult as sort of a compliment because it asks the viewer to visit it longer. And I never want to make a piece that someone just brushes by. I want him to visit it and unpack it. So to be able to look at the materials and really say, oh, what is that, that, that must be nylon. Oh, that must be, you know. Or why did the artist do exactly, this? Exactly, yeah. So yeah. to be able to come back to it again and again and to be able to say. And not just to look at it like wallpaper. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, a lot of people have had that experience with an artwork that the first time they see it, it's, it's challenging or repulsive yeah. or they, they really don't like it, but it keeps bringing them back. It keeps yes. bringing you back. And every time yes. you look at it again, you you think about it differently. You start yes. to see more things in it that you didn't see before and, and that becomes powerful. And one of the reasons I think art is undefinable is because it's always pushing back. It's always rebelling against what came before because art really has to be of its time to be true. It has to be about the issues and feelings and ideas that people have in that age. Mm. And that's why the Renoir landscape doesn't interest me if it's made by you today. You know, sure. it, it's not true anymore for you or me. I feel like both of your works have a formal aspect of cohesion, you know, where the elements are, are, have a certain unity and relationship so that there's a formal wholeness about the work. Mm -hmm. There's no question when you look at these works that they're works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I see artwork and I say, is that art or is that not a work or is that, you know, I always know your works are works because they have that cohesion, that uh, sense of finding a significant form, uh -huh. which I think is what mm -hmm. we're all going for. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one of the reasons that happens is, uh, well, first of all, we both, we've been doing this for, for a pretty long time, but we've had a lot Your of kids. evolutions. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm relatively <laughs> long time. We're still fairly young, but, um, you know, we've probably been working on art seriously for about 20 years, um, wow. which is a fairly significant yes, period is. of time. Um, and you're fully devoted to it, thinking about it every day, I can yeah. tell. Yeah, we, we think about it all the time. But it's also that we didn't just you know, decide that this is the way we were going to make work and just start making it this way. This is a process for both of us that unfolded over a long period of time. And uh, Emily's works in particular have a very long gestation period. You know, Some of them have been 
in process for years before they're finished. I was wondering, do you have anything else on the horizon coming up or? Um, well, being that we both now live in uh, live workspaces in Lowell, we have the privilege of opening up our home space as a studio um, visit. So every month, in the first Saturday of the month, we welcome visitors in oh, how great. Western Avenue Lofts. Um, so that has been a nice opportunity. It's like a permanent uh, exhibition then. Mm -hmm. yep. Wonderful. Well, uh, and what are your websites? We should tell the people how they could get in touch with you. or So they could probably just eat, uh, search on Western Avenue Lofts and they'll find that information about the open studios? Yeah, there's a blog and then there's a website. Um, and then my uh, website is emilysandagata.viewbook.com. And uh, we both also have pages on the Arts Worcester website, which oh, link directly to cool. our websites. And Very mine good is um, mm -hmm. robsandagata.wix.com slash rsandagata. So it's a little bit longer, but um, there's, there's lots of ways you can find us. Yep. You can find them. They're on, they're on the web. So look them <laughs> up. It's wonderful to look at and read. And uh, it's been a terrific experience for me. I learned a lot doing this show. and. And uh, it was really fun getting to know both of you. So thanks, thanks a lot so for much. coming in Thank and sharing you so much your work for with us. us. That's about it for today. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you another time for another edition of Arts and Ideas. Mm -hmm.